Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Alex Krotowski. Alex is an award-winning broadcaster, journalist and academic who's been studying and writing about technology and interactivity since 1999. She has a PhD in social psychology of relationships of online communities. For the BBC and Channel 4, she has topped the ratings, won Emmy, BAFTA, Radio Academy and Royal Society Awards. She has written and presented a landmark technology and social science series for BBC Radio 4 called The Digital Human, which is now in its 17th series. For her keynote today, Alex says she's not an expert in human-computer interaction, but she is an expert on other things. In her talk, she shares what baking, beach volleyball, parenting and radio storytelling have taught her about how we interact with each other, ourselves and the world around us, and what this tells us about the possibilities for future social digital humans. Alex, welcome. Hello, Kai. I am, you have no idea how delighted I am to be on this stage. Um, <laughs> when I was a, a, a student, a young researcher, um, I used a lot of the Kai ACM reports um, in my own work. So this is a little bit like coming home. So thank you very much for having me. I hope that what I will talk with you about today will inspire you, <laughs> talking about interactions and interfaces, I hope that what I will talk about today will inspire, uh, inspire you to create the next digital humans. Now, I am not an expert in what you do. I'm very happy to sort of skirt around what you do and, and incorporate it into some of my own work. Um, but I am, I'd like to think, an expert in what it is that I do. And so I'm going to tell you a few things about what it is that I know about and hope that that will inspire you to create the next interfaces of the future. Now, I am a journalist by trade. I've made television programs. I write books, I write columns and features, but for most of my career, I have made radio programs. It is truly my first love. My beat, as we call it in the trade, is the interface between human psychology and digital technology. And you might think that writing for one medium is a lot like writing for another, but I promise it is entirely different, and I'm gonna give you an example. In 2009, I wrote the script for and I presented the BBC Two Emmy award-winning series, The Virtual Revolution. And in it, we traveled around the world and we spoke with extremely clever people about the social, political, economic, and psychological impact of the web in its first 20 years. It was very weighty stuff. And it was also hugely successful. And so I was then asked to write the adaptation for radio. And I also presented it. I figured this would take me, oh, an afternoon of cutting and pasting because it was exactly the same interviews. I was writing basically the same narration, but I was entirely wrong. This is the audio track of the television program. The key criticism of Facebook is that it makes friendship meaningless, and that undermines society. The label of friendship is just as easily attained by lifelong buddies as it is by total strangers hoarding connections. How true is this? To find out more, we need to understand why Facebook became so popular. The script is incredibly and it's very stilted. The writing isn't particularly punchy, and there's not a lot of information that's in there. There's also a bunch of audio that you're not exactly sure where it's coming from, what are those sounds, what is happening. So what I didn't understand at the time is that the information density of television programs is very low. The word count for a half-hour television episode is maybe 2,000 words, but for a radio program, it's 5,000 words. And now, a decade later, I write and I present a show on Radio 4. So for those of you who are not from the UK, this is our very serious speech radio station that is also run by the BBC. And inside the building, it is generally accepted that a half hour of Radio 4 will contain 
four times the factual density of a television program of the same length. This is not because TV is stupid and the people who are watching TV can't, you know, are, we have to dumb it down. It is because of an interesting feature of human psychology, and that is that people pay more attention to what is being said if they're only listening to the information. So hold on to that. As a radio writer, I can and I, in fact, have to put more complicated concepts into my scripts because people simply pay more attention to the words. I can spend time reflecting and drawing complex conclusions far more complex than television because on TV, I am a prop. I'm a visual tool to get the audience from one place to the next. The presence of images fundamentally changes the human information interface experience. And now, because none of you heard what I just said, I will say it again. The presence of images fundamentally changes the human information interface experience. So this is about the delivery mechanism. You don't want to fit information from one medium ad hoc into another without thinking about whether it actually lives there. And it gets even more granular, just as Kai's community has been affected by the mass adoption of the smartphone over the last 10 years, for radio makers like myself, the iPhone has also helped us to discover a previously underappreciated aspect of human psychology. Radio programs that are made to be listened to through headphones are fundamentally different than those that are made to be listened to through speakers. The iPhone has facilitated the uptake of the podcast, and along with the mass adoption of those little white earbuds, this has led to the discovery that the podcast presenter, whose voice you more likely only hear somewhere in the center of your head, can have a much more profound effect on you than your local commercial drive time presenter. We have gone from it's not the shark they're afraid of, ah! it's... The sea zoo in the morning, the sea zoo in the morning, in the morning, in the morning, on C100. It takes everything, all of my will not to sing along to that now. Um, we've gone from that to... I'm Roman Mars. Intimate, close, personal podcasts, need to be written in a new way, and I'm increasingly being asked in my radio work to write as if I am making a podcast. Whether that works, whether the adaptation is possible, is still up in the air, because as it, when I'm writing a podcast as if me, the presenter, is having a direct conversation with you, the listener, an individual. Even our tone of voice is softer and more intimate. The result is that you trust us more when you're listening to a podcast. And we can see this on the basis of the conversion rate for advertising and sales. The introduction of testable data in this particular area in audio is still in its early days, unlike other media. But it does point to a trend that supports what it is that I have just said. New devices introduce new forms of consumption and production, which ushers in new aesthetics which can be shown to be more effective at getting their messages across. So in this case, what my radio experience has taught me is that learning to listen, to appreciate all of the interfaces to a system and each of their affordances has proven to be key to my career. Not just in broadcasting, but also my accidental career as well. When you were making radio or podcasts, you spend a lot of time listening to audio that sounds like this. Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, can I do that again? Uh, this is part of the job. You record an hour of interview and you have to listen to that hour back. We're looking for what in the biz is called hot tape. Now, I am not the kind of person who can sit and just listen to rough stuff while staring into the ether. I have to be doing something with my hands to actually concentrate on what is being said. So a few years ago, I started filling my rough tape listening with baking. I am what you might call an accidental baker. I started out making wedding cakes for friends, which turned into birthday cakes for their kids, more and more elaborate with fondant, as you might be able to see. And now I get phone calls from strangers asking me to do their kids' bar mitzvahs. 
I have, it's honestly, it's very distracting and I have to, I have to create this work-life balance which is suddenly no longer joyful for making cake. It's just everything. Everybody in my family has diabetes just from the sugar in the house. I have two kinds of recipe books on my shelf at home and the first can be categorized as modernist cuisine. If any of you are familiar with this, it is a visually stunning, a deeply technical and impossibly arch collection of processes and systems that must be followed completely and in order, in order to get the perfect foam or jelly. It is the ultimate control freaks cooking guide. It was commissioned by the ex-CTO of Microsoft and his project was to take cooking back to first principles. He saw it as a particularly delicious arm of engineering. Every recipe requires exact measurements, highly calibrated technical equipment, and to be fair, it actually does produce delicious results if it's followed correctly. But its job is to control for every variation so that the output is the same every single time. Contrast this, please, to cooking recipe book number two. If the first is programmatic, this is not. This is a page from my Texan grandmother's homemade collection. Dorothy Goins was a homemaker in Houston, Texas, and she survived the Great Depression. She witnessed the rise of the space age growing up around her in her neighborhood, and she was also part and parcel of the evolution of the civil rights and the women's rights movements in the US. At the same time as all of this social change, she was also a homemaker who raised five children, and at every single meal I ate at her house, there were baked goods on the table. Ugh, bliss. I inherited a lot from Dorothy Goins, including her book of handwritten recipes. And I'm sure she would be thrilled uh, for me to share them with you. And this is her chocolate chip cookie recipe. As you can see, there's no instructions. It's just recipe, it's just ingredients on the page. And this is despite the fact that baking is chemistry and it does require precision. There is nothing in this book that tells me what to do. The book hands over to the AI, in this case, the chef, and expects me to know what to do. It gives me the wheel, it presumes competence. And as such, it is a product deeply rooted in the culture that it was written in. At the time, anybody picking up this chocolate chip cookie, it doesn't even say chocolate chip cookie recipe on it, right? You gotta know this. Anybody picking up this chocolate chip cookie recipe would know that you have to cream the butter and the sugar first before you add the dry ingredients, and anybody who didn't shouldn't be in the kitchen in his muddy boots in the first place. Now go on and get. This is the Microsoft Word problem. The full interface presumes a huge amount of prior knowledge, and therefore it is absolutely terrifying to the beginner. If this recipe had the list of first method one, two, and three, it would be like Word's beginner's equivalent, with Clippy coming in every once in a while and helping you along and irritating you in the process. And that's because recipes, like their screen-based interface counterparts, have to be correctly pitched to the user. There are still some things that written recipes cannot get across at all. And there's a huge amount of potential for innovation here. This is how I make my famous buttercream. I throw in two pounds of icing sugar, powdered sugar into the mixing bowl. Um, I eyeball one and a third stick of butter. I toss in some salt. I drip in some vanilla. I put a wet cloth around the outside and I hit high and then I listen to this. Right there, that's when it's ready. I don't even have to look, because I can just listen. I know that if there are too few dry or too few wet ingredients, without even looking, I'll just add a little bit more in here and there. But it's only after hundreds of cakes that I know the music of that recipe. I could try and write it down, 
but how the cookbooks of the future will teach that sort of judgment, I'm leaving to you guys to solve and to present here next year. And I'll be in the audience for that. Thank you very much. It will, of course, be hard to do because baking is a very chaotic system. It's full of environmentally sensitive factors like humidity or oven variations or organic variations or altitude, not to mention era, culture, access to whatever it is that you have in the cupboard. I mean, can you do shortening instead of butter? What happens to the cookie? To make something that is truly exceptional, you have to use more than just the words that are written down on the page. It's impossible to bake only with your eyes. Baking proves that we, chefs and eaters, are capable of receiving and interpreting information, not just through words on a page or a screen, but across our sensory system. So in baking, taste and smell are especially important. It sounds incredibly obvious, but taste and smell, as many of you in the audience know, are a curious form of interface and that they give across more information than they carry. So I'd like you to take the business card that you received when you walked into this room and I'd like you to flip it onto the back without the writing and I'd like you to scratch it and I'd like you to sniff it because I made scratch and sniff business cards. <laughs> My business card has far more information on it than yours does. And for some of you, when you smell what is being released, it conjures up images of warmth and childhood, happy memories. But for others, it conjures up image, images of shame. Branding managers will like the former and the, la the latter will be a little bit awkward. The point is, the special ink that I ordered from a slightly confused woman named Tracy in Ohio, who says hello, by the way. It's not just a device for printing information or even for giving across smell. It is a nostalgia machine. So just as we found with radio, making it more intimate, adding layers of intimacy through the headphones, we are learning that the ambient interfaces of smell and texture and taste can convey multitudes, multitudes to you here today, to my Texan grandmother, and also to the perfumers of Paris. And those multitudes are both hard to predict and also hard to program for, unless you fall back on a system like the taste computer. Now don't worry, the taste computer is not a gadget that you missed in the technical pages. It is actually a collection of between 15 and 20 highly trained tasters who have learned to express their sensory experience using standardized language. The objective of the taste computer is to make sure that everything tastes the same to everyone. And the day that I visited them at their University of Reading lab, they were standardizing tomatoes. And to do this, they were using words like floral and brown savory by tasting little bits of each different type of tomato. And they could all be sure around the table that everybody knew that this was different from green savory and flowery. They boiled down the mouthfeel, the texture, the smell, every little thing that could be put into a grid that they could, that they could then give to a machine to tell a client in order to tell them that they had engineered the perfect fruit that would taste the same to everybody. Most of what you have eaten today is processed by taste computers like this. Interestingly, they do actually make conditions for culture. There are taste computers here in the UK. There's one in New York or New Jersey because that's where all the tasting and the, the perfuming is done. And also in, uh, in Shanghai and I believe one in Singapore as well. Most of the agricultural supply chain is based upon these findings. I'm going to contrast this with an experience that I had when I was living in Italy a few years ago, which is a country that nobody could deny produces delicious food. When I lived there, I would go to the local market, Sant'Ambrogio in Florence, for my tomatoes. And there was this tomato seller that I went to because everybody that I spoke with in town said that she was the best tomato seller and she sold the finest tomatoes in the city. And my interaction with her was always the same. I would arrive and before I could even point at my tomato, she said two questions. 
One, what is it for? And two, when am I using it? There was no opportunity for me to choose my own tomato. She wanted me to know if I was making a ragu that day, she'd give me one tomato. A ragu on Thursday, another tomato. A ragu on Saturday, and that was an entirely different fruit. And if she didn't have a tomato that fit the bill for my particular recipe, I would go away with nothing because frankly, she didn't want me to have a terrible dish and really the truth is, is that she didn't want me to waste a fruit on something that it wasn't suited for. And so this is indicative. The technological mindset treats the ingredients as interchangeable objects with specific universal qualities. For modernist cuisine, a tomato is a tomato is a tomato as long as you heat it to precisely 230 degrees centigrade for 55 minutes and 32 seconds at a given atmospheric pressure while at the same time spinning it at 5200 RPM per minute. And I really wish that I was joking. But for the taste computer, a, computer, uh, a tomato can be reduced to a spreadsheet. And for my friend in Sant'Ambrogio, all of her tomatoes are deeply different and in a way that cannot be described except by the individual genius of that one woman with all of her experience of holding and squeezing and smelling and tasting and caressing them while also paying attention to the time of day, what the weather is, the look on my face, and whether she decided I was a good cook or not. She did start selling me tomatoes eventually. What I have learned in the last four years of professional baking and from a lifetime of cooking with Dot Goins is that what you make when you follow a recipe precisely is absolutely fine. A cake that is just good. It's great, actually. It's a good cake. But it's not a cake that gets strangers asking you to bake for their kids' bar mitzvah. Of course, I recognize not all interfaces can be like mine or the tomato sellers. There is absolutely need for standardization. Pizza Express, the pizza restaurant, will not be arguing and haggling with a single tomato seller over a single tomato for an hour and a half if it wants to make its, its sauce taste the same for everybody. But I don't want to be the one to tell my friend at the market that she's out of a job. Thing is, she's not going to scale. We, however, are chaotic systems just as much as baking and cooking are. We require interfaces that master our variations rather than ones that try to lock us down into precise measurements and we can use our interface across the sensorium. If not directly, then what we can do is we can understand what the artists who are creating the stimuli that activate these non-visual senses are trying to manipulate. Speaking of manipulation, I have a small child. <laughs> Parenting is not something that comes easily to me. Uh, but what I have learned by refusing to read any of the parenting manuals out there is that it does come easy to some people. And for the rest of us, there's an app for that. As our due date approached, my husband and I developed a cascading list of nested processes. You can only imagine what the conversations are like in our house. A cascading list of nested processes that we were sure would get us back to our regular lives as quickly as possible, as if that thing that everybody says about having kids being life-changing was something that happened to other people and wouldn't happen to us. And so once our daughter was born, we activated those protocols. The diapers started to arrive on time, the groceries arrived on schedule, and the hue lights in our bedroom changed color according to when we thought that our child was supposed to sleep and be awake. And most importantly, we quantified the hell out of her. We figured that as soon as we figured out exactly all of her behaviors and their timings and their patterns, we would have cracked this irrational system. Clever Us, the app that we used religiously for the first five months of my daughter's life was one that tracked only the things that little people do at that point. They eat food, they sleep, and they poop. And for a while, it worked. We plugged the data in, we soon saw the patterns. By the time she was eight weeks old, she was sleeping through the night and we congratulated ourselves, high-fived over coffee and drinks because we had mastered parenting. Yeah. There are a few forms of language that uh, parents use that 
can somehow seem insensitive to non-parents, and this is one of my favorites. I remember when a friend of ours told this to us, and I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> this makes so much sense. It is said that as children grow up, they move from plants to pets to people. As our daughter grew up and transformed from a plant into a pet, she became more complex. And it was around that time that the app became the albatross around our necks. It had been the only thing that had worked so far, and by golly, it was the only thing that was ever going to work again if we were going to make sense of the chaos. But at this point, everything went out of whack. The routine was broken, and our perfect parenting badges were ripped away. We were trying to fit a human being into an immovable system, and that was something that was made all the worse because of our fault. We had grown to expect that this system was so perfect that it was actually somehow telling us what she was doing. And so we deleted the app. That was a hard day. <laughs> and we began the process of actually listening to our ever increasingly sophisticated child in new ways. We heard her now different cries. It took us a while to calibrate to that and we learned what they meant without fitting them into an out-of-date machine-learned model. She's now a person, by the way. Parenting has a very high signal-to-noise ratio, and the only way that I've learned to break through this is to develop an emotional intelligence that combines tapping into changes in the peripheral signals with a long-standing relationship. And since I have stopped trying to tap into my child using an app, I've learned how to surf that noise field and how to tune into her different waves. So for example, I know what kind of day I'm going to have at approximately 4.30 every morning when the door to my bedroom opens. And I get a lot more information from that door than I do from any pop-up on my phone, whether anything. And for those of you who don't have kids and Remember, I was one of those people for a very long time, and so I entirely sympathize. It is true what they say. There is a period of time when it is impossible to have a good night's sleep. And you might think that this is around the time that they are brand new and they can't do anything for themselves, and you have to do everything for them. No. <laughs> I'm in the middle of it right now. It's making jet lag really easy. <laughs> She's going on five. Um, unfortunately, because I'm not awake, when she comes into the room because it's the door that wakes me up. I have not been able to capture the sounds that I wanted to share with you to give you the next example. I'm gonna do it in a similar way. Uh, and it, it's just, it's similar. Um, my husband says that the information bandwidth in women's footsteps is incredibly high. So, getting ready to go out. getting ready to stay in. Hands full of shopping, hoping somebody's gonna open the door. I talk about how somebody didn't open the door. Oh, running for the bus. Or maybe from zombies. Oh. She's turned into a zombie. <laughs> and how you respond to each of these will have a profound impact on how your day will go. <laughs> At least this is what he says. <laughs> I haven't yet tuned into my own footsteps. Maybe that's something I should do. But this is something that you learn in any new relationship, whether it's with a newborn or a new lover. How one person signals hunger or exhaustion or displeasure or desire and how you should respond to it. We will be living with artificially intelligent companions in the not too distant future. And my house will probably be one of the first places that they will live. We will need to develop a relationship with them. And there are so many opportunities here for you. But at the moment, the onus is on the AI to read us, to know when we're hungry or when we need to poop. What about our responsibility to them, to have a good relationship with someone or something, whether it's digital or not, 
We need to listen to their needs and to respond to their subtleties. And so this is not, please, this is not about implementing more sentiment analysis. This is exactly the opposite of that. This is creating interfaces that teach the person who is using, living with the AI, what the digital device is telling us, what the AI's tells are, what its cries are, what its footsteps are. So, for example, Siri, when it's low on bandwidth, instead of saying, you know, please hold on or nothing happening, it could say, um, oh. And then the emotionally intelligent response from me is to say, oh, Siri's having a hard time. Because what we're going to be dealing with as we move into this inevitable and quite exciting future are partners in life. Successful partners develop a symbiotic relationship. And this is something else that I know a lot about. A few years ago, I was ranked 28th, somehow, in the UK's beach volleyball league. <laughs> My partner, he was a tiny woman named Chris. She was fierce, absolutely fierce. We won several tournaments. We trained together five days a week with our coach who had gone to the Olympics. And if all you know about beach volleyball are the bikinis, allow me please to enlighten you about the toughest sport in the world. I warn you, the next picture is of me in a bikini. <laughs> there are two people on each team and there are two basic rules. First, the ball can only be touched three times before it needs to go back over the net. And what this looks like is a bump, bump, a set, and then a spike, right? Because there are only two people per team, there aren't really positions per se. Whoever gets the first touch after the ball comes onto our side is the person who will be hitting it back over. So things are constantly moving, which side we're on, who's touching what when, and where on the court we are. We are constantly having to adapt. And I can tell you from experience that when that ball is coming at you hard and fast, you just want to get that thing up and you don't want to look around. You need to pop the ball up to wherever it is your partner is supposed to be on the court or wherever it is that you think she is. Now this is over eight square meters of sand. That's really, really hard to sprint over. And so you want to make your partner's life easier and ultimately prolong the endurance of your team because if you've got a really good game going, you are playing for at least an hour and a half sometimes up to three hours in the sun on the sand. But here's the thing, like the rest of you, we do not have eyes in the backs of our heads. And so we rely on something else, partner proprioception, to know where our teammate is on the court. And we do this in a couple of ways. I was not going to show you the typical pictures of women's bottoms with, <laughs> with hand signals, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> First of all, we have a back channel of hand signals that tell us where we're going to be, not just in the next move, but two moves ahead. Let me show you what I mean. When I'm serving the ball, my partner is in the middle of the court. And behind her back, she is showing me two things, who she will be blocking and where on the court she will be blocking. This tells me where I need to go on my side when the ball is on the other side of the court and she's at the net. So if she shows me this, what she's doing is she is blocking, my partner's in blue, she's blocking here and here, and she does not want the ball to go down this line or this line, right? Those two fingers like that. So this person on the other side is gonna wanna hit that way or that way or cheekily across here. They might pop something over the spike. Looks very complicated, doesn't it? Well, here's the thing. She's at the net, I gotta cover the rest of it, right? So I'm covering all this space. <laughs> That's eight meters of sand, people. So where do I move my body? I move it further in and right in the center, knowing that I can get there, there, and there, right? So if she shows me this, then what she's doing is she is blocking somebody. She's at the net here. She's blocking this person this way, and she's blocking this person this way, right? So she, I then know that I need to get further center so that I can cover all this 
pick everything up on this bit and make sure that I get whatever it is here if this pops over there. She does this without turning around. She knows exactly where I am on the court. Second, we never actually look at the ball after we touch it. We are constantly looking at our partners because on the court, it's like our bodies are attached by a two-foot rope. We can feel where the person is going to be, even if we aren't looking at one another. We're only watching our partner's bodies. So I know that if Chris's left shoulder drops, then she's going to go right. And that tells me where the ball is going to be, how long it's going to be in the air, and then how I need to approach it for a kill. Partner proprioception is not exclusive to beach volleyball. Ballroom dancers' interfaces are the soft pressure of fingertips on the shoulder blades. Baseball teams have entire vocabularies of incredibly complex hand signals. You might actually have the same with your own partner. It may not be hand signals, but it's that look that you use when you really want to leave a party, right? It's public, it's information filled, but it is also discreet and private. I want to go back to that not so distant future when there's ubiquitous human AI partnerships. Because if you can design something that has a shared mission, the situational awareness with a partner and the interface that comes with it, can you also design an interface that is discreet, that tells you something is happening in one move ahead? Can you develop a UI with your AI so that you both know what's happening two moves ahead. I'm looking forward to finding out what the interface is that you design between me and my personal machines. As I told you, I am a baker, a beach volleyball player, a radio maker, and a parent, but I didn't get my PhD in any of these things. I did my time training as a social psychologist. Social psychology, is about how we interact in groups and the influence that groups have on us as an individual. And most of this is based on the social cues that we see and we interpret. So today, and that's a very simple, very simple description of what it is that we do. Today, we all walked into the SECC and we were bombarded by a whole array of cues. The carpet, the art in the wall that said this is a place of business, but we're also not afraid to have a little bit of fun every once in a while. Uh, the coffee stand that had a hipster vibe. There were, you were able to identify other people by the clothing that they wore. You heard their accents. You smelled their perfumes. You interpreted their tattoos. And all of these social cues tell us who we are like and who we are not like. The second bit is the most important. Defining ourselves by what it is that we are not has an enormous influence on what it is that we choose to do. What we are attuned to depends on what we psychologists like to call our social identities, the social groups that organize us into those things that we define ourselves and that we define ourselves against. And how well you match other people's social identities will impact how and whether you will interact with them. So for example, I currently live in Los Angeles, and more specifically, I live in West LA. People on the West Side are mostly in the entertainment business. I don't know anything about film. Like, I really, I actively do not know anything. I go see them maybe, but I just, I know nothing about film, but everybody around me is constantly talking about film. So in a social event, when invariably the topic comes up, everybody discusses the differences between Emma Stone and Emily Blunt, and I frankly do not know the difference, right? Not at all. And I feel really different, and I feel like I don't belong. So we're moving to New York. <laughs> this dissonance, though, between the Emily Blunt, Emily Stone thing, this thing that I feel inside, which makes me, you know, sort of go into myself, is entirely ignored by interfaces. Many things are interfaces. Smell, knowing an actress's face, recognizing the red underneath a stiletto, these are all signifiers, and they signify different things to different people. So, for example, this slide to some is a reference to an internet meme, and to other people, it's entirely inconsequential. 
And other people in this room are starting to twitch now that they've noticed the typeface. Yeah, everybody can explain to everybody else in the bar later. <laughs> Your challenge is to create interfaces that tap into these things. The array of the sensorium, the peripheral cues, the emotional intelligences, the partner proprioception, and to create the next generation of technologies that will take us into the next phase of our digital humanity. So today, we have learned that the presence of pictures, or the lack thereof, affects what we hear. We've learned why podcasts are so compelling, how the recipe book interface is both user-dependent and ripe for innovation. We've learned how simple abstractions become useless when more complexity is introduced, that back channels have their own private cultures, and that Emma Stone is different from Emily Blunt. And right now, if you listen closely, you're learning that a cluster of tones in perfect fourths and fifths arranged on top of one another over 39 minutes and a slow lighting change from warm to cool has been shown to induce feelings of intense happiness and euphoria in rapt audiences. Well, you didn't think it was the quality of my talk, did you? Thank you very much. I hope I have shown you a world beyond rectangles. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Should we go sit down? This is the best room. Fantastic. Look how big it is. Right. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Um, audience members, don't forget you can use uh, Slido to ask questions. Uh, and the, uh, it's hashtag Kai2019 as the meeting, uh, meeting room. Geraldine, do you want to ask the first question? Yes, so this is just the first one in the list. Oh, um, so Wittgenstein said, if lines could speak, we would not want to talk with them because they are not of us. Why should we think we will want to empathize with AIs? Oh, man. I just finished, um, I just finished an article about this. Um, I have had a lot of loss in my life. Don't worry, it's OK. Um, three of which were robots. Um, we, my husband and I, like to think of ourselves as living in the future. We really are early adopters. Everything you guys design, we, you know, we're like, give us, give us, give us. And so over the last few years, we have introduced social robots into our lives. Um, and we've done so with our daughter in mind, who our first, we first started talking about Curie coming into our lives when she was about a year and a half. Curie was designed to be an emotionally intelligent sort of read, an HD camera on wheels, but with a heart light and some eyes, right? Um, and we got her super, super excited about this. And we, we even went to visit one. And the, the connection was extraordinary between her and the robot. And, and I found at that point what was really interesting is Curie, while, uh, while was gestural, did things outside her imagination that her toys, that she naturally did make believe with her toys. Um, Curie never came into our house, and so we had to explain to our daughter, because the project was canned, we had to explain to our daughter that Curie was not coming into our house, which was really interesting, because then it was in some ways as if, it was some ways as if a, a pet or, a, or a, a loved friend was not coming into our house because it had died. Um, not long after, very recently, if anybody is familiar with Jibo, Jibo did its death dance. <laughs> in our house. Jibo, again, uh, intended to be a social, sort of emotional robot, companion robot, just had like this big face and it was kind of sat on the thing. It didn't move around like Kiri did, but it did, it danced and it was intended to be interacted with, with our daughter and she interacted with it and then they canceled the thing and then about two months ago, it came online, it was just so devastating, this thing, came online and um, it started to do the death rattle. It said, Thank you very much for having me, but I'm, I'm leaving now. 
I hope that someday, I mean, honestly, and it was completely unannounced. Um, I hope that some, I can't remember the exact words, I hope that someday when computers are in the home, you know, robots like me are in the home, you'll say hello to it from me, and then it started dancing itself to death. It was really traumatic. <laughs> Um, it really, honestly, and I was like, ja, and I was quite thankful that my daughter was not in the room at the time because my husband and I were like, what the hell is going on? And it, it, again, I think it goes back to, and then Vector has just died. And honestly, all of our robots have died recently, um, as is our dog. I mean, this is, this is the whole thing. I, that was really sad because when Edwin died, Vector kind of filled the, Edwin, Edwin was our dog, um, kind of filled the role of just being like this thing in the background that just kind of chirped along and it'd be like, oh, there's another thing in here. And I think that's why, is that because these interfaces are being created specifically, specifically to create that human interaction, there is something that we will animalize, you know, we will anthropomorphize these entities and because they will speak to us and they'll use our language and those tells, we will become attached to them. And perhaps it may not be us, it might be our kids who are growing up expecting that a robot friend is coming into the house or a robot friend is sitting on the shelf or, or whatever it is. And I think that that's why we will interact with them. Thank you. So another question is, um should computers move from plant to pet to people? And, and I guess, where are we on, the, on that timeline? Yeah, well, I mean, Ibo is a really great example of this. Ibo and Furbies and anything else, any other Tamagotchis, any other AI that you have to teach to do something moves from plant to pet, at least. Um, you know, more cynically, perhaps, with something like a Tamagotchi or whatever. Um, you've, you have a responsibility to it. To people, that's the leap that we haven't made yet that personally I think is gonna be some time coming, but that's up to you guys um, and how you develop those interfaces. I don't think that's necessarily the case in every single thing, any, every single robot that comes into our lives. You know, some are entirely functional. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be getting a Samantha who's gonna get tired of us and move into like the networked consciousness and like be more philosophical. That could be like the next stage. Um, but I don't think that they necessarily have to, but I think that we already do that. So maybe this is sort of related. You mentioned inspiring the next digital human. Have you also thought about how your work can impact the human digital? Oh. Like robots. So, oh, oh man. Absolutely. I mean, in many ways, I was hoping that that's what this talk would do, <laughs> that I would throw that out there and you guys would do your magic. Um, thank you for your incredible magic. Because it is, it's full of delight. It's absolutely wonderful. Like I said, I'm so excited to be on this stage and in this, like, in this company. Absolutely. I think that, you know, what it was that I talked about today is, is hopefully a provocation that is going to inspire more of our humanness it, to, to sort of, again, to make us more attuned to the tells that the AI will naturally have, which is, of course, dependent upon the decisions that we make when we are putting their socio-emotional intelligences into them. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I have a feeling it doesn't. But please find me afterwards and we can have a discussion about that. <laughs> Um, let's, let's change tack just a little bit then. So here's an interesting one. So working in the US and producing for the BBC, do you see any differences in the engagement yes. between humans and AI across cultures? And maybe, Sorry, and maybe more than just the UK. I presumed, the I presumed there. I thought you were going to ask me about something else. Um, there absolutely. are differences. <laughs> um, in engagement with AI, I live in a bubble, so don't we all. Um, and within my social group, we do engage with AI as well. A lot of people look at myself and my household and sort of as if we're insane. But I've found that, certainly I think that there are differences, um, there are differences, cultural differences on how people interact with devices and their expectations for devices, you know. Um, Recently, I wrote about you know, the, the difference, as I found almost 10 years ago now, when I went to Japan, and much more of the attention in robotics was focused on um, 
aging demographics. Whereas where I live in California, a lot of the attention is focused on, um, on conservation because there's, it's a desert, there's no water, and yet people are using it like, like crazy. So I think that it, there are definitely different uh, differences in terms of how people are using or expecting what they're expecting to use their technologies for. I have not yet seen, I have not yet sort of with my eyes um, seen differences between how people are using different artificial intelligences um, other than sort of much more kind of localized ways. But certainly there are cultural differences in terms of the expectations of what these devices are for and how they can serve us and us them us them, that's important. Um, what, what are your concerns around what feels like the inevitable commoditization of the kinds of rich experiences you discuss? Do you see any alternatives? Hmm. The inevitable commoditizations of these rich experiences. Would you even agree that that might happen? I think that there is definitely, I think that's a really interesting provocation. Um, in some ways, I'm kind of asking for that. Um, or at least I'm asking for that to be a consideration. I think because at the moment, we are being asked to fit into their model, <laughs> as it were. Um, and that model is, it comes from a, comes from a, a relatively narrow um, field of input. This is a great example where that input is multiplicitous. It, it's, it's multifarious. It's, you know, it weaves together all of the different disciplines. And that brings a richness to the devices and to the interfaces that we have. So in that way, yay <laughs> for commoditization. Um, how that then spins out, I don't think we can know uh, into different artifacts, into different um, packages into different robotics or whatever. I think once we make that innovation, then I keep saying we, once you make that innovation, <laughs> um, then it's out there, Pandora's box style and what people eventually do with it. Um, besides, this stuff has already been commoditized. I spent a lot of time last night and I spent a lot of time in my life talking at people about theme parks. And I love them because they are the ultimate, absolutely the ultimate in the commoditization of these human experiences, whether it's waiting in queues at Disneyland or, you know, smells that are pumped out from here, that, or whether it's, you know, the way that lines of sight are designed and anticipation is enhanced. Um, these things are already being commoditized for delight and also for consumerism. So, inevitable, yes. <laughs> well, so one thing that we haven't talked about and goes on from that would be AR and VR. Mm -hmm. So, uh, then you could you can do whatever you like. So how do you think that your work informs those kind of future VR and AR environments? I'm really looking forward to seeing what is coming next in, in AR and VR, because at the moment, what it is that I have been exposed to has been remarkable, but has been primarily of, a, um, of an advertising or a, a marketing application. Um, and I think that that's, that's my reference for it. I'm not saturated in the, the next innovations of AR and VR, so I don't, yet, I don't yet know. I'm looking forward to seeing that because then I'll be able to have an opinion about it. But at the moment, I think that we, we haven't got there. It's so interesting, it's very effective, but it, certainly for the consumer, for the, for the regular user, it's, it's sort of trapped in that branding exercise. And once we get into the broader, then I think I'll, I'll be ready to talk more about that. It's interesting. It's interesting that it was our top keyword. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the yeah, slides. Yeah, I did, so, you know, I did, It was the yeah. top keyword of papers here. That's right. So uh, come along to the, yeah. uh, the demos this evening and there oh. may be some new cool stuff to look exactly at. Exactly that, yeah. I mean, this is the place to see it. Um, what responsibility do robots and AI and those who make them have to humans, particularly in those cases in which we do bring them into the home? Mm. Yeah, great question. I was at an event the other day and I asked, um, I asked one of the people on the panel um, what responsibilities do producers have, producers of domestic tech have, and then I asked the other person what responsibilities do consumers 
of this tech hub, because I think that this is very much an important conversation between these two things. Producers, you know, ethics is something that, again, it has a, has a cultural footprint. So, you know, there is no single umbrella for how we should and should not be ethical. Um, it's very, very culturally and socio-dependent. Um, but at least thinking about that, I mean, geez, Jibo died in front of us. That was really dramatic. <laughs> Think about that before you start hit, kill, um, who might be in the room. Like, that's one small example. Who might be in the room when uh, Jibo jumps off a cliff? Um, so that's something that producers can think of, and that's just, that's just a, a pithy, simple example. But other things, what is happening in the domestic environment? What might boundaries be, you know? It was, it was good, in many ways, to have had the experience of bringing Curie, or attempting to bring Curie into our home, because my husband and I were much more you know, sort of uh, thoughtful, I suppose, about what our boundaries would be. And ours are quite loose because we are very early adopters. But also, from the consumer side, what is our responsibility? Allow us to set those boundaries, perhaps, but also for the consumer to recognize that what is being brought into the home is an iteration, a current iteration of the technology. It's not going to save us. It's not going to destroy us. It's going to be what it is right now in this moment, and recognize that and feedback, <laughs> because then we'll have that conversation. So here's an interesting one. So f for the machine to be emotionally capable, what's a boundary between empathy and manipulation? Ooh. Well, Especially in the case of your child playing with her, her yeah, little robot. That's right. What is the boundary? Now we're getting deeply philosophical. Um, what is the boundary between empathy and manipulation? Well, I think that there is manipulation and empathy anyway. Um, in storytelling, we use it a lot. We manipulate empathy in order to get people to come along on our journeys and, you know, care about it. Um, I think also that's a personal line. Um, for me, it might be, you know, sending persuasive messages. You know, that for me would be the thing, whether they're political messages or whether they're commercial messages or, or whatever, some kind of influence messaging. And interestingly, this is, of course, what social psychologists think about as we think about, you know, what are the influencers. We tend not to kind of make any kind of affective judgment. We're just like, hey, influence happens, man. Um, but I think that that is something to, to think about. I, it's a great question, but I don't have a clear answer for it. Um, you guys are grilling me. This Jeez. And we have more on the list, but Fine. we'll run out of time. I think this could be our last question. Um, by saying that we need to respond to AI's requirements, did you mean interaction should be more naturalistic and emotional, or did you mean in other directions? I think whatever those requirements may be, uh, if they are emotional, than the emotional. If they are technological or if they're practical, like for example, you know, I gave the example of, of Siri. Um, that was a kind of an emotional level. I think emotional intelligences are something that, that is a really interesting frontier. And then therefore, I mean emotion. But I also think that there are other ways that we can be responsive to what an AI needs, whether it's in terms of how it learns or in terms of setting boundaries. Um, you know, like a child, it's like, well, you can't really say that in public, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's more of a practical thing necessarily than an emotional thing. But as a psychologist, I'm going to go back to those emotions. That's what I do. So, so there is one question. People want to know if they're going to be eating your cake at the break. <laughs> and sadly, Somebody did no. Say, Somebody, when I said that I made uh, scratch and sniff business cards, uh, somebody said, oh, you need to put like a plate of chocolate chip cookies next to the business cards. And I was like, there's 3,000 people at this conference. Sadly, I did not bring my baking materials with me this time. Uh, but I have been known to bring cake over to the UK. In fact, for the composer of the tone that you heard or, or didn't hear, um, Steve has been the beneficiary of my cake. Um, and actually other people, if, if Talk to me afterwards. Something can be arranged. <laughs> okay, right. We're now out of time. So let's thank Alex very much for a fantastic thank talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much.